uh, I think our last one was very like, like you kind of mentioned, we're on like very similar parallels in terms of, you know, current goals and just like the whole entrepreneurial journey as a whole. Um, so it was cool to kind of see where you were at back then, you know, just graduating college, you know, working full time and starting this, you know, the Virtue Man. Um, so I'm super excited, you know, kind of alert us now, what has changed since then? Uh, and then kind of update us, like I always like to ask, what are you currently most excited about because of that change, you know, at the moment, like what's the main focus? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So um, I appreciate obviously getting a chance to connect again. It was cool. Like you said, we kind of, I feel like even though it hasn't been that much time elapsed, it feels like so much clarity has happened. I mean, I think this is the case for many entrepreneurs that like year one of your journey is like a ton of learning, right? You're learning not only new skills, but like directions about yourself, the yeses and the nos of where you want to go with the business you start. You may completely take a left field pivot, change direction, update the offer, all that kind of stuff. Um, not to mention those, like the internal lessons, which obviously is something that I'm a big proponent of is like continuing to do the personal work and making sure that you're aligned with your highest capacity um, and like the highest direction of which you're capable so that regardless of the material success, you actually enjoy the process the whole way because if you can just play in the game on the order of five, 10, 15 years and like enjoy the whole time, you will be rewarded because most people just won't stay doing a single thing for long enough um, to see the fruits of it. Um, so this first year has been a ton of learnings, but I think the last time we connected, I was still building what I am working on now in parallel with my full-time engineering job. And I, I, I imagine many of the people that might hear this have heard my podcast, but if they're curious to hear about like more at length about my kind of mindset, stepping away from that and stepping into this full-time, I did a dedicated episode on that when I decided around the turn of the new year to quit my engineering job, um, and step into what I'm working on now. So that was like, a big mechanical transition, I guess, um, a lot more maybe on pressure internally, because I think we kind of wrap ourselves into these moments where we make it out to be a big decision. And it's, it's funny, I, I have a guy in my program right now, Shade, I'll shout him out, I don't know if he's on the live, but um, he actually like joined uh, probably four, four weeks ago. And since been, being in the program, he's actually sending in, sending in his resignation letter, at his full time job. So it's been crazy to like, witness third party now the same stuff that i remember going through in my head like kind of the you uh like one of the big things for me is like you know they took the risk on me giving a job opportunity do i owe them something you know they were great people to me this was a good opportunity maybe i share um, um but ultimately like i told him and i told my former version of myself is we don't really owe anyone anything you know it's every everybody's life is one of one to live and uh, obviously, I, Memento Mori is like a big thing for me. So if you kind of use the razor of death as a kind of thought exercise, like if I were to pass away, like they're putting my job description on LinkedIn a week later. So nobody really owes you anything in either direction. And I think we all owe it to ourselves in the world to follow the calling that we hear and try to pursue that highest passion. So I made that decision around January. And then since then, have been able to sustain um, full time with what I'm doing, which is super exciting. So um, obviously the general game has not changed for me. It's still, um, the self-development program, the Tribune man program, um, and the project at large with the podcast as an arm and then the content that I put out and plans for future developments there. But, um, the offer I think over has matured a lot over the first year. I, I think when I set out to create it in its initial conception, I just wanted to give the world, like create a product that had everything, like all the tools down to like training, nutrition, and mindset, like kind of over deliver. But when you offer everything in entrepreneurship, you kind of offer nothing. There's like that famous, um, I guess like story in sales is like a guy was trying to give you a thousand dollars if you just pay him one, but nobody would take the offer because they just didn't believe it was real, even though he had the money to give. And uh, that was a lesson I learned from Vash who uh, we got connected through for, from my entrepreneur. He was talking, we were talking off air about offer creation and um, kind of niching down, which is something that is maybe against my instinct because I consider myself a bit of a jack of all trades, more of a generalist. And so I didn't want to create something that was limiting. But at the end of the day, you have to be clear and communicate to your audience, like who you're targeting and what you're offering to them. So I'm definitely now targeting and more specifically focused on working with founders, entrepreneurs, and creatives 
on helping them determine their unfair advantage to help build undeniable brands that they're extremely fulfilled with um, and align with their personality based on their life experience and a lot of like the introspective work that I've cultivated through the program. So the program itself has been updated and resources have been added. It's still very fundamentally um, similar to how it started out because all those tools are, in my opinion, timeless and effective, especially based on the feedback of the guys I've worked with, but really kind of tailoring it and trying to work more and more with, um, you know, high level entrepreneurs and founders that are interested in stepping into a space similar to myself. And I think that if we're going to ever, if anyone's ever going to differentiate in entrepreneurship at large, you really have to just double down on you. Like, what do you have to offer that is one of one unique compete in a class of your own? You know, Dan Co talks about the, the niche of one. There's a lot of people talking about it. It's kind of a, a timeless idea, I suppose. But, um, I think it's so transcendent. Um, and not only is it going to make you more effective at like the X's and O's, you're going to be able to make more money, but you're like, we, like we started this conversation, you're going to stay in the game longer because it's more fulfilled for you. And you're going to want to continue to scale and pour in those hard nights and fight through the, the natural resistance that comes with an entrepreneurial journey, which is doubt, imposter syndrome, questioning if it's the right thing, avoiding shiny object syndrome, the stuff that just continues to come at you. Um, I think it has to, the most successful business, businesses have to be an outpouring of your soul. You know, we look at like the greatest, one of my biggest inspirations, if not the biggest is Steve Jobs. And like Steve Jobs and Apple were synonymous. They were one. It was truly a pouring of him. The company didn't exist without him. And quite frankly, he didn't exist without his mission and calling to build that company. So um, that's kind of the space that I'm, working in now is still around self mastery, but really trying to target those entrepreneurs that really want to find that aligned mission. Yeah, no, there's, I mean, there's certainly a lot to unpack there. Um, but I'm glad the biggest thing that kind of stands out to me that you even said kind of in the first line is that clarity, like you kind of outlined, you know, the biggest change has just been things have become more clear. And, you know, reality is, you know, we talked, it was week 48 of last year. So like, I'm just, I'm not good enough at math to tell you what date. I'm going to say it was like the first week of December. Um, but, you know, that, that's a good six month period, right? right? Of where we were at then and then kind of like where you're at, you know, you had the, you saw the path there. You saw, <laughs> yeah, at some point, um, you kind of had the passion there, but there was no like clear, okay, I'm going to target these people. I'm going to do this and do this. Now it's like, okay, I'm going to target entrepreneurs. Here's what I bring to the table. Here's kind of the expertise I use. And you're doubling down on that. And I really like that. Um, and just to kind of, I'm kind of curious, since you decided uh, to niche down, kind of what has been the, like, what's been the biggest uh, change you've had to make in terms of, uh, like, yeah, acquiring new people to join your program since you niche down? Like, what's been, is it in the content? Is it in the sales process? Like what is, what has been the most major shift? Definitely. It's a good question. And I think it's a, uh, it's a yes and rather than either or. Um, I think that a lot of this clarity has been coming in the last few months. So a lot of these changes are ongoing, but I, it's funny how, how we can always write the story and it becomes really self-evident in retrospect. Like it, it, the offer was there for me since the beginning because I had been helping friends like yourself or like even Ryan, who's on the live right now, like build their brand. Uh, Kyle's another one. Michael's another one, like people who are stepping into this space. And I just feel like that was my, you know, I, I deem it within my program, your Achilles advantage, your unfair advantage. What do you have to give that's different um, by knowing your strengths and weaknesses very innately. And for me, it was helping other people see theirs, communicating their value to them, affirming their strengths and facilitating that growth, as well as just general kind of brand characteristics and storytelling aspects. Um, so as far as what's shifted for me, so one was going back to uh, like, I'm obsessed with product and I want to make sure I always deliver the highest I can. So I'm right now kind of ramping through like a 3.0 of my program, going back, coming through all the videos, all the content, all the worksheets to make sure it's extremely aligned exactly with what I'm saying I'm offering so that there's a one-to-one -one there and that it delivers at a high level. Um, secondarily, yeah, definitely being a little bit more targeted where I'm outreaching to people, like as far as like comment sections, where I'm doing my uh, lead generation from, I can, now that I know more specifically demographically who I'm looking for, I can kind of niche down towards different places. Um, and I have a few different pockets, but obviously 
the goal is to continue to grow organically so that I have an audience curated for what I have to share. Um, and that's a game that, because I enjoy the process of writing, putting out the content, um, making the podcast, all of that stuff, I know that over time, like audience building, you're finding, as, as all of us have found, like organic growth is hard. It just takes time. You just have to stay in it for a while. So, you know, I think this year two is going to be really big for myself. Um, I feel like I'm approaching that proverbial hockey stick that we all kind of like hope and dream for in, in audience building. But as far as cold outbound right now, I'm still in that stage. So I have to reach out in places that I think I f would find those like-minded entrepreneurs and then just stick with the daily practice. Um, I'm definitely at this point beyond the, like, I'm happy to take nose. It, it's like uh, water off a duck's back, I guess, at this point. And then circling back to your, your main question, what else has changed um, since the offer? Yeah, I think a huge part is now in content creation, not communicating too, too broadly. I mean, I use a platform like Twitter, um, a little bit more of an open-minded journal, just speaking my thoughts um, and kind of ideating content more rapidly. But when I put together like actual pieces, whether that's on the Vitruvian Gentleman page that are written out, or if I sit down to write about a longer form podcast or kind of like think about these grander ideas, um, making sure that it is targeted towards now I have a definitive message to share and it's going to be aligned with the offer. I think people that are really killing the game there um, is like Nick and Logan with Launch Socials. They talk about just kind of like hammering your offer, but also your more fundamentally your message to your audience just over and over. And for me, it kind of comes very passionately and very naturally because I want people to be on fire and alive for their purpose. I just want more people in the world giving their gift. And so I think that that is my story to tell. And I'm just going to continue to iterate, tell those stories. And because I consume content that's related to it, whether it's the books I read, the philosophy I'm revisiting, the stories of the great men of history, um, inspirational documentaries, whatever, it's very congruent with my life. So it's really just like a matter of using myself as a rebound for the stuff that comes in and then sending it back and sharing it with people of like minds. Yeah. yeah. No, that's awesome, dude. And you keep hitting on this. And again, I want to shout out, you know, Ryan who's tapped in on here. Uh, he just had a, one, of, one of Ryan's most recent guests on Alchemist Library. He was talking about this same idea of you no, know, like part of the process is thinking like you can go build a business kind of around your most authentic self and just showcase who you are and naturally build an audience that way. And then realizing in order to actually see the success you're looking for, you need to find out what problem you solve and for who and just focus on that for a period of time and then allow your personality to kind of mix into it. That was like the biggest takeaway I took away from that. And I think it's so it's so accurate because we hear it all the time. Like, oh, you need to focus on one thing, but saying it like that, where it's like, no, focus on what problem do you solve and for who, and don't work, like understand that you can still influx your personality into that, but you need to like focus on that each and every day, not, otherwise your mind will go to a million places. We're all very talented in multiple different ways. If I asked you, you know, what's a hundred things you're good at, you'd be able to spit that out for me in 10 seconds. So if that's how you're approaching your business, great, you're going to help a lot of people, but you are not going to be able to consistently move forward in some, and become an expert in something. So I really like kind of hearing how you've, you've taken that, that approach. Yeah, it's a, it's a hard duality to ride, and I don't know that I have found a, a perfect thesis on it um, between like mastery and being an effective generalist. Um, I was actually just on like a walk thinking about this, and... I think most of where I land right now is that the greatest people, not just people who became great, but like one of the greats, like the legends we talk about and still remember to this day, um, were always generalists. Like Alexander the Great was not only a combatant, but also in many ways a philosopher. He was tutored by Aristotle. He had great strategic knowledge. He had great philosophical knowledge. He had great religious knowledge, esoteric knowledge. Um, Napoleon, same way, well-read, well-written, um, clearly a good communicator. All, and Steve Jobs, obviously, not only an elite marketer, but he understood product, he understood um, finance, he understood marketing psychology. That just having the ability to be dangerous in a ton of arenas, that makes you one of the greats. And I've always been that kind of black sheep, the couldn't find a peg for, or couldn't find the hole for the shape of peg that I am. And for a long time in the time and, and day that we're in, that's a hard thing, you know, 
you know, like college, they're like, okay, what major can we put you into a little box for? Like when you graduate, what's the ER word we're gonna give you um, so that we can give you a job title, engineer, like doctor, whatever. Um, and I, it, it's just not congruent with myself. But I do also think that when I look at people that I greatly admire, like um, Robert Greene, he talks heavily about the concept of mastery. You have to become great at something and then communicate that to the world so that from an onlooker perspective, they can be like, oh, he's the blank guy. So I acknowledge the power of mastery and I am excited to figure out what my specific arena of mastery will be. I do think that the best way to find yourself and align yourself, it's funny, this book is actually on my desk, but a good one for anyone listening is this tiny book, Mas uh, Managing Oneself by Peter Drucker. It's on the Harvard Business Review Classics but it talks about kind of evaluating what are your strengths and weaknesses. And instead of trying to just spend all your time and effort bolstering your weaknesses just to get to an okay level, figure out what your advantages are, double down on those, and then make sure that you're at least competent in your weaknesses so that they're not actual kind of holes in your armor. But you don't have to worry about out competing somebody who would just smoke you effortlessly at those other things, you know, like that's, especially for guys like you and me, when we, aspire to build a business that eventually we hire people into and scale and whatever, I will eventually outsource the things that I'm doing now, but I'm not elite at, nor do I want to be elite at or naturally predisposed to. But if I am very introspective and self-analytical, finding my Achilles advantage, if you will, I know that things that come naturally to me are verbal and written communication. Like this kind of thing was always more natural to myself. I didn't have to study the art of podcasting. I just clicked record and I was better than most people at attempting it. And that definitely sounds very self-aggrandizing, but I'm just going to speak objectively. And as when I look at, okay, what are my things to master? It makes a lot more sense to me to double down on those things, make a podcast a week for the next seven years, eight years, 10 years, and become one of the greats at communication, um, a skill of kind of infinite leverage in the internet age that we live in and see what it, where that takes me. Maybe it means I connect with somebody and they bring me onto their team. Maybe it means I have a premonition for a new vision and a new business that could scale to $100 million in the future. But the what and the how will be presented to me as long as I stay in alignment and kind of like energetically am aligned every single day, right? Like you don't want to just get into a position, build a short form content agency because it can print you money. But now you've just made your nine to five that you tried to escape in the first place. It's just your nine to five versus somebody else's. I think entrepreneurship always has that level of sovereignty. So it's going to give you a lot of satisfaction. But really aligning yourself with stuff that is like deeply, deeply you and deeply, deeply passion driven, you'll just stay in the game longer. Even if it takes you longer to make the, the, the proverbial check or get to the illusory you know, 10K per month or whatever your metric is, like the proverbial you, whoever's listening, like whatever you're trying to get to, if you're willing to play the game long enough, I, I just, I believe and take the words of people further down the road than me, like Hermosi and others, you're just going to, you're going to get rewarded. It's it just kind of more of a, like a fundamental universal principle in that way. Yeah, no, there's definitely, there's a couple of things I want to kind of comment on there because it is, it's cool to hear you first express like how just naturally the podcast like flows to you. And I think there's a, there's an underlying, like it makes sense, right? Like I think in, in my, my opinion, like you have a passion for helping people find their purpose and the podcast is a great way where you're just, just you're doing that every time like you're getting people to more or less explain that for the first time in god knows how many years because not every guest is writing it every day not every guest is saying it in the mirror 10 times like we when we do the podcast it, like it really gets people to talk about those things and i'm i like how that like you said like that kind of energizes you it's just like the framing that it's a a podcast so that, that it can't be something that you like scale. But no, I think that's awesome. dude. I think you really should dial into that and using it as a platform to try other things. Like you said, like you're very good at community building, you know, taking that, that into account, like having guests that your community, now you have these people, like you can be more direct in those ways. So I know we were talking about niching down earlier. It's like, okay, you've kind of figured out this is what I like doing. This is really where, you know, I can help the most people now start niching down on the different ways other people are doing this to generate kind of that community building but also that revenue source um to where you are providing enough value you know revenue is a value exchange so i think this is a perfect example 
Um, I like it. We're very par- We're very similar in that sense. Like just picking up, there's millions of podcasts out there, but I don't think people understand how important it is that they are a platform to put you in the room with like-minded thinkers so that you can have those conversations that you're not just going to get walking around the street in your hometown or in your apartment. Like you can get in the room with guys like us, guys like the guys we're hosting and still have an impact. Um, so I think that's, that's super cool, man. Yeah, it's a kind of an unforeseen byproduct that I had no idea was really coming when I set out for the podcast. Quite frankly, I think the idea to have a podcast was given to me by God. I mean, I can I can name the specific people. I'll shout out Arlen. Like he was encouraging it as like a very 80-20 way to make a bunch of content and put yourself out there. And on an objective level, that is the entry point. But I had no idea how first of all, I would enjoy how much I would enjoy it, how much I would maybe be like naturally predisposed to it as a medium. But like, I'm so glad you touched on like opening doors. There is no better door opening excuse to just be like, to reach out to people we have eff- effectively no business talking to. Like, hey, can I uh, like sit down for like an hour and like pick your brain over Zoom? Like, it's basically like the kind of the networking or coffee lunch. But on top of it, you get content. And two, like you're giving them value just by providing free recording, prompting them. A lot of people, I think in this day and age, it's a lost art to have like long form, very present conversation. Cause I mean, you get it. You're as a solopreneur. It's like, we literally don't, we never have a time where there's not something to do. You know, we have to force ourselves to take breaks and like be healthy, take long walks, go to the gym, all of those things. And that's part of the game, but there's always something I could be doing for the business. There, there's never not a thing on that list. And so I think giving people an excuse to take their break with you and sit down for an hour, an hour and a half, two hours for these longer form conversations. And for me, I love to like, don't, not treat it as an interview, but again, just a conversation between two people and letting people drop into themselves, asking them questions that maybe they don't think about on a day to day. Um, and it kind of share their story. People love to talk about themselves. It's very much like a, a Carnegie principle with like, how to win friends and influence people like ask good questions and sit and be present and listen with them. People love to feel seen. Um, I think that's like a very transcendent principle as well. So giving people that are further down the road, that ability. And meanwhile, we get the benefit of like, Holy shit. Like this guy has a hundred million dollar business and I'm in the room with him. And I got to spend an hour talking to him like unbelievable value exchange for myself. And then the kind of beautiful cherry on top is that on a universal level, we get to record it, hit upload, and now that's just in the ether, providing value to whoever stumbles across it. And when my podcast and your podcast gets to, you know, 100,000 listens per week, like people can backlog and be like, holy shit, this was a banger from 2022, 2021. Like, that's crazy that he was doing it the whole time. I didn't know he talked to so-and-so. And it's just per- permanently there. Um, so, yeah. Cool. Yeah. And I want to go down this podcast rabbit hole a little bit. Um, just because I am always curious, like I don't ask enough podcasters this, but like who has been your, cause you are, how many episodes in are you? Is it- I, just, I just released 41. So you just released 41, 41. And I'm curious, like who has been kind of your most memorable guest or like, who's the first guest that kind of comes to mind and you have like a favorite mm-hmm. conversation that's- just so far this year. Gosh, that's hard to say, man. I mean, everybody's so special for different reasons. Like my first guest that had like any sort of presence online was coach Lewis Corolla. He was the strength coach at the university I went to. So he was my first like big reach and it was like, cool. Like, holy shit. He has 40 K followers on Instagram. Like that felt really big and monumental to me. So him taking the time was really special. Um, obviously I don't know that it's particularly like, he's not in our corner of the internet. He's not in our Twitter circles. Like he's a strength coach, but that was very gracious of him. So that stands out to me along the journey is significant to myself. Um, and you know, like guys that have become really, really good friends. Like I can't, I would be remiss if I didn't shout out Ryan. Like he's sitting in here from Spain, like listening into this, like, and growing alongside him. That's been really, really special. Um, as far as people, I was maybe surprised at how good the conversation went. I really love my conversation with Winston a lot. That was a really successful episode because I mean, he just hasn't had the chance to, his audience is like so well curated. They love him. He's kind of like this cult, very mysterious figure. And so to kind of peel back those layers, let his audience see him in a different light felt really, really special. Winston stands out. Um, but I mean, I, I don't want to, I almost want to list everybody and give everybody their shine because yeah. they all went so well. So um, for those that may come back and hear this, I'm not 
per personally like ignoring them, they're all also special. And I, I really do mean that. Yeah. Now I want to take a different turn on that. That's good feedback. Cause I, I like, I test out these questions and I like to see what does well and like what kind of, what kind of answers are yeah. wrong. But I also want to hear this. Who would you say are your next three? Like, I want these guys on my show before the end of the year type in a perfect, perfect world. Who are the yeah, top three yeah, yeah. guys to get on? If you could even get one of them. For sure. I, I mean, I have a, a long list and I, I'm trying to take after my friend Ryan, which is like just fearlessly sending DMs. Like the kid just messages anybody. It's, it's insane. And I need to get better at just like firing it off. Um, so I think one that has, I've kind of been, almost been like working my way towards is by choosing people in the circle is Solbra. I want to connect with him, not only because he's such a successful entrepreneur and has a large following. So there's the natural like arbitrage of the audience aspect, but I really actually want to like kind of go at, him with some of his beliefs because i think like he thinks deeply he's very well read but mm -hmm. there are interesting incongruencies sometimes I, I find in his content and i really want to kind of pick at the mind of the guy and stop like having a perception of who he is um and really get to actually sit down with him because i've talked to many people now that have talked to him and they're like oh i know him some people think well some people think others and i want to be able to form my opinion so soul bros one in our little corner of twitter um I also really like dream guest for me is Riva Tez. Do you know who Riva Tez is? Okay. She's not off the top of my head. She's like one of the most fascinating people I have st come across. Very hard to describe, which is something that I also like about her, but like started her journey a long time ago in, uh, she's like from Europe or from England with like putting herself through college by founding a toy store. And she studied philosophy at university then she founded her own VC in, in SF, like made up of a venture capital firm and got money, like just like finesse the game. She was, she's somebody who Arlen has been like, has connected with in the past. And he was, when he was like, everything is a scam. That's her thing. Like talking about like kind of breaking the game of the world. So she's done a lot of really, really fascinating projects. She studied neuroscience. She's funded AI projects. Um, and, and most recently she's somehow involved with the funding with the uh, Prax Praxis project which is another project that I think is just really, really interesting. So Riva for sure is like really high up there. I'm just going to hammer her on the Twitter DMs. I was able to like, she followed me on Twitter after I like tweeted something. I, I was just like consuming voraciously all of her essays, podcasts, appearances. And she hasn't really been out there on a lot of podcasts. And she, she mentioned something from um, the Fountainhead, a quote from the book. And I thought it was fascinating. So I kind of was like, wrote a little tweet out about it and I was like homage Riva and she retweeted it and then followed me. So that was really cool. So as soon as she followed me, I was like, Hey, I love your shit. Like I'd love to have you on the podcast thus far, but I'm going to stay diligent on that and uh, manifest that into being this year. So she's a huge one. I'm also really fascinated by the Praxis project in general, um, just because of the scale of its ambition. So I'd love to be able to sit down with Dryden, somebody who's like obviously very directly involved with it. Um, but there, yeah. there's, there's a long list. And what I like is that I, it's not all my, my ambitions are not, um, they're not directly targeted at audience size. I just want to talk to really interesting people. And so it's cool to like platform and, and as my platform grows, I'll be able to open the doors to smaller creators, like a younger version of myself, and then also be able to connect with, like we talked about before people that are, you know, punching above our weight that are kind of further down the line than us. Yeah. No, that's awesome, man. That's a that's one I'm gonna check out. I didn't know she did all that work with like like Arlen, and that sounds like a very cool, uh, cool, cool kind of rabbit hole. Too. Amazing mind, dude. You, it's quite the rabbit yeah, hole to go down. Now, I do want to kind of take a directed uh, we'll wrap up here pretty soon, but I am curious. You know, you mentioned quitting your job earlier, and we haven't really dove into really. I haven't got a chance to really talk to you since then. I remember we just kind of texted back and forth um after that um but i am kind of curious you know what has been the process like the you know take us through what it looked like you know leading up to quitting your job a little bit because i know you touched on that earlier but really you know what is how is your what are the feelings like and what do you what advice would you have for someone in a similar spot is really what i'm trying to get here yeah it's a great question and i have a tendency to be long-winded so cut me off if i ever am just rambly but i think at the leading up to it it was one of those things where always knew it was part of this future. At some point I was going to quit. 
but you know, I'm going to be the one who has to make that call. So when is it? Is it six months from now? Is it tomorrow? Is it three months from now? And so I was kind of taking this time, like looking at the objective side, like, okay, how much money do I have saved? How long is that going to give me? Um, theoretically, you can always save more. There's always more runway. So I was looking, ultimately, I made the decision with between four and five months of savings. Um, I felt like that was enough-ish. But the reason I made the decision was I just kind of kept sitting with it. And the more days I kept going in, the louder that voice and the discomfort was where I was like sitting in the office and I was like, I don't want to be spending any of my time here. I want to pour all of my effort into growing what I have here. And I feel like if I can go 100% at it, I can make it work. Um, And so a lot of it was kind of starting to listen to that intuition. And I felt like the louder and the larger that discomfort grew, the more I was inclined to do so. But I also wanted to be fair to the guys that did hire me. And so I gave them like a pretty big warning shot. I think I told them in uh, um, November, sometime end of November, that I was planning to leave in January so that they had the time to you know, start the recruiting process, start the offboarding process for me, organize my material. Because it was a startup. You know, It was like pretty much a ragtag team. I was one of four employees. So I had a lot of responsibility there. And so I needed to kind of gather and organize all that stuff for them. But post making the decision... Uh, I mean, it was obviously very exciting in the short period, but then it was like right to work with everything I was doing. It was awesome to not have to fit in this stuff around a nine to five or an eight to five in my case with the startup. So I was able to just kind of go all day and do what I want, carve a little bit more time out for kind of like self care. And like, I don't know if I want to do work outside, I can do work outside. Like I think the biggest takeaway is just that feeling of sovereignty where even though I hold myself to a very high standard and I try to be productive every day, I can do whatever the fuck I want. Like tomorrow I could just do no work. Now I have an internal sense where like I need to be working all the time and you probably feel that too, right? Like that, that almost guilt that kind of builds up. And so riding that line is, is helpful, but being able to spend time, take a day, uh, train in the middle of the day, go visit a friend, get, have a lunch, like do all of the work on my phone and lie in the sun. Like those types of things are kind of unreplaceable in my mind. And it's the stuff that is essentially allowing me to live the life of a millionaire, a multimillionaire, a billionaire today. I have access to all of basically the same things, just materially different, right? Like I can't afford a Rolex. I can't live in the, take a trip to the Maldives, but I can take a trip to Florida. I can hang out with my friends. I can do basically what a perfect day looks like with all of the freedom, just slightly less on the monetary level. And I, in my opinion, if I play the game for long enough and if I give enough good to the world, those things will come my way inadvertently. And I'm not a super materialistic person anyway. I feel blessed in that sense. Like I don't have aspirations for X watch or X car, but I definitely do have lifestyle aspirations where I really want to have total control over my time, live wherever I want, provide for a big family, have a lot of kids. And that in our world requires money. So that's been the biggest thing for me is like sovereignty. Um, And what I will say to anyone who's like either on that edge or loosely considering it, like don't make a reckless decision but I would say always act before you think you're ready because like I alluded to at the very beginning, you can always save more. And if you play that game of I'll quit tomorrow, it's kind of like I'll go to the gym tomorrow or you're just kicking the can and there's always going to be a reason to stay or a reason not to move. But the future is a complete illusion. It's not promised. It's not guaranteed. You don't know how long you're going to have here. And when I run everything by the momentum mori like Occam's razor for me, if I had gone to bed and not taken that risk, I wouldn't have been satisfied. So I needed to be okay with the risk. And I knew I was too competent to really end up in any sort of dire situation, right? Like I'm not going to be in a van down by the river. If worst case scenario came along, I've now developed all these skills and competencies and have a network of a bunch of talented people. I could go get a high ticket sales job. I could become, I could start my own marketing agency. I could do a lot of different pivots that would just be part of the story. It's like the, Miyoto or Mimoto Mushashi, however you say that, um, he, he talks about like there is only the road. And so we think about, oh, I've fallen off the path. I've stopped working out or um, I've strayed from the mission. The truth is you can't leave the road. There is only the road. And so whether you think your business is going to look like X and it turns out to look like Y, you didn't fail. It was just a direction in the path you couldn't see at the beginning. So I have no idea. Like I, if we do this again in one year, it's hard to know exactly what it's going to look like. I hope and feel very intuitively that it's going to be similar to what I'm doing now because I feel very aligned. But if somebody enters my life and changes that direction or a new idea is given to me, 
Um, that's exciting. But again, the how and the what that is to be given. I just need to stay aligned with like who I am um, and continue along that path. Yeah, no, that, that's a great point you hit on because I think being, it's just kind of the sake of like even being this, this early in the process, like you can see, um, you're exposed to a bunch of people who have gone through that period of really, uh, like you said, having the time to themselves uh, to you know figure out exactly what it is they want to do and adjust to the change. I think people where people get what people really get wrong about entrepreneurship and something I've experienced head on and like you said probably didn't expect it and as most people won't is like you have to be adaptable to so much change. Like in order for things to and Hermosi hits on this in order if things are not changing they're likely not getting better because getting something getting better or worse is still the same kind of mechanical thing but nothing like you can't have a zero day where like nothing happens because if you have a zero day it's really going to just be a negative change like it's changing regardless is really where i'm going with that so whether you put the positive intention that it changes for the good behind it or the just decide not to do anything or get complacent you've just automatically put it in the other body I think we get caught up in thinking there's like this middle, there's middle ground where like things don't have to like constantly evolve, but it's really just like the intention will constantly, evolve. you know, the intention, the mindset, the mission, but the actual physical, what it looks like is always going to go through, always going to go through change. And because everyone's different, whatever you're, com you know, consuming on the content end of things, again, that's the battle we have to face coming up in this time compared to maybe some people that are 10 years ahead of us. And like, it's an underlying b battle because they'll say it on the flip end. Oh, you have so many resources. At the same time, we have so many distractions and so many like mixed things in our subconscious <laughs> that are like dictating the physical, what's happening on the physical. And that wasn't the case. It was quiet back then. It was just follow the person in front of you and you don't have all these distractions. Now it's like, oh my God, that guy has what I want. And that guy has what I want. And that person has what I want. And now I want all of these things. But you need to, like you said, the whole theme of this, just stay consistent, stay within yourself um, and kind of go with it from there. But yeah, cool, man. Yeah, yeah. avoiding that trap, that trap of mimetic desire is, is hard. It's a very human one. It's existed for a long time. But like you said, it's amplified when everybody who's doing anything in this world has an Instagram and they're flexing like to the nth degree. So not only do they have what you want, but they got their different ways. There's like five people. They all have the same car you want. But this guy used outreach through this method. This guy's only on Twitter. This guy's only on Facebook. And so as an entrepreneur, it's a very shiny object. Like, oh, I need to pivot my business. And when we're young in our journey, it's like, damn, like maybe I'm not seeing the results I want. I need to change. I need to change. I need to change. But we also have to work in some arena for long enough to see if it's even going to work. Um, yeah, so avoiding that shiny object and then avoiding mimetic desire. And I think, like you just said, the more you know yourself, the more clear you are with who you are, the answers become very clear. It's like, I could probably get very wealthy at X, Y, and Z. I just don't fucking want to like, and I'm okay. To, I'm okay to say no to that. Yeah, no, that's a great way to let's kind of wrap this up, man. Any final thoughts, anything uh, we, you kind of want to, any me final message you want to give to the audience and then obviously, you know, plug us in with it before we can find you. No, no major final thoughts. We could, we could get into some of the questions people asked. I don't I didn't know if we want to turn this into a Q and a or not. Um, yeah, I was seeing if anything, you could explain the practice one would be good. I'll, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll message Logan. I think I'll message Rogan or, uh, Logan okay, yeah, directly. Probably a pretty extensive one. Steve, um, what was Steve Jobs a master of? That's a really good question, but I don't know question. if there's a direct answer to that or if you want to just shoot your opinion on it real quick. Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I'd say, hmm, uh, this is like a little bit of a spiritual answer, but I would say that he was a master of himself. Like he had such clearly defined sense of self and, and taste that he never like waffled or undulated or had a lack of clarity on what the next step for Apple and for the products were. Um, it's why I think he was so successful and it's kind of the, no one talks about it because they're trying to figure out what his talents and skills were. He was a marketer. He was a product guy. He was whatever. And he wore a lot of those different hats. But the ability to walk in into, a investor, into an investor meeting and kick your bare feet up on the table just because you are who the fuck you are and you don't give a damn, like, that's insane. Like, he just knew so clearly who he was. 
there was never a question. Like somebody brings a different, two different product ideas into a room for testing. He's like, we're going with that one. And then he just walks out. Like he always knew. So I think knowing himself, being a master of himself would be my answer. I don't know if that's a, I don't know if that's a cop yeah. out, but. No, I do like that one. Just in the, and I will uh, hate to do it, but just in the spirit of this being a busy, busy Monday, I have to hop on a sales call. You're so good. Zach, I totally appreciate you taking the time. Um, of course, this will be dropped on Sunday. Um, and cool. for anyone that's still here listening, I've got this happening again with Ryan on Sunday. We're going to go live with the week of profit. So really appreciate you, Zach. This was fun. For sure, brother. Uh, let's let's stay in touch and uh, reach out for anything. Yes, sir. Have a great day. Peace. Peace.